Walker. It's so good to see you, Doug. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Curtis. Good morning. Good morning. We are so blessed to be able to gather together as a family around the word of God and to see everyone's smiling face this morning or profile. Um, we're coming out of Resurrection Sunday weekend, and mine was blessed, and I'm sure yours was as well. And we're continuing our study in uh, First Peter. So... Um, before we actually go into our prayer with uh, Pastor Melinda, we're going to have Grandma Perkins open us up in a song. Amen. Amen. This is the song that we gave, uh, we tell our children at Easter so that we made them really learn what Easter means. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believed in me, though he was dead, yet shall he live, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never. Never die. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Sister Melinda, Pastor Melinda, can you open us in prayer and then we'll jump right in? Yes. So, Father, we just thank you, God. I believe that the prayer is what Mother Perkins has just sung. It's, it's the reality that we, we come out of a high time of celebration, but we are still in that place of celebration because because of you, as Mother Vera May saying this morning, that we should never die, that we will live, Father. And so you called us to an abundant life right here on earth, as well as an eternal life. So Father, Amen. the joy of the Lord is our strength this morning. We are blessed. We are blessed to be here, God. And, and there was something so magnificent about Mother Vera May singing that song. May we all be reminded this morning that in you we live, we move, and we have our being. Bless Amen. our time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Dr. Van Der Ark, can you give us a summary of where we've been in first Peter chapter one through two, and then we'll have JP introduce our awesome speaker for this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. I am uh, delighted to give a little uh, review of this beautiful book of first Peter. Uh, Peter wrote this book to console the Christians who were suffering persecution. Their persecution was at the hands of non-believers. And Peter's purpose in writing this book was to encourage them to continue living a life of sanctity and purity despite the troubles that they were going through. So this book of First Peter is most appropriate for us to study because we're also going through perilous times in so many parts of the world, terrible catastrophes are going on. And so this book is a wonderful consolation for us that God is in control and that we need to worship in spite of terrible things going on around us. Amen. Thank you for that summarization and reminder. Um, Priscilla, did we have any announcements? 
You're muted. I just yeah, want to introduce a book that uh, that I'm not sure if all of our readers have uh, have heard of. Um, in 2016, um, I would see my I, I was traveling with my dad, and all of a sudden I see uh, uh, Wayne Gordon coming to our hotel room, and uh, and and my dad, you know, they were um, in their in meetings, and um, and and uh, and they were working on this book and they were um, saying something is wrong in our society, something is deeply wrong. And this book is, is a response. Um, it's the belief that all lives matter. The belief that all lives matter is at the heart of our founding documents. But we must admit that this conviction has never truly reflected reality in America. Movements such as Black Lives Matter have risen in response to recent displays of violence and mistreatment. And some of us defensively answer back, all lives matter. But do they? Really? This book is an exploration of that question. It delves into history and current events, into Christian teaching and personal stories in order to start a conversation about the way forward. It's raw, but hopeful words will help move us from apathy to empathy and from empathy to action. And this book is, is very short, uh, a quick read, but it has so much information in it. And, um, and it, it, it helps to start the conversation um, in a way that is, um, that, that, uh, that where it doesn't make people angry. So um, I, I, uh, urge you to get it. Go to our website at jvmpf.org and uh, and order this book. Uh, order it for a friend um, or or a group. Thanks so much. Oh, the other thing we have is um is uh where where is it? Uh oh. Um. There it is. I had it in the wrong spot. Um. <laughs> If you um, want to donate to the Perkins Foundation, we always need your support each month. So um, continue to support the John M. Perkins Foundation. Um, times are, are, you know, are not as strong right now. So we're asking for um, special donations um, to help us, especially this summer. We have programs coming up. We're wanting to have more kids come back this summer. And, um, and we need your help and support to, to make this happen. So um, go to our website and, um, and donate, or if you want to uh, mail to us, you can do it. Um, uh, we have a PO box. And um, if uh, we're, we're just so grateful and thankful for all of our friends who, um, who support our work. Thanks so much. Amen, awesome. I'm seeing all types of comments inside of the chat about people saying that they have the book folks going to get the book i have mine um it's really good <clears throat> to use in small groups i saw a few people down there say that as well and so let's in this time that people are actually finding ways to affirm division we need materials that point us back to unify and this book is one of them it's pulled straight from the scripture it's not a a long read, it's a short read, but it has enough potency inside of it to get the job done. So go and get it. Um, we are actually gonna jump right into our time of study now. And JP, can you introduce the brother and friend that we have that's gonna lead us in our time of study today? What a privilege. He has become a great friend. He's a board member of, of our ministry here, uh, Matt. And he wrote what uh, he organized or found out what the church was supposed to be, that it was supposed to be the outliving of the in living one God, one mediator between God and man. We would know that was happening because of our love and our oneness that we live out and our world is broken by adding blackness and racism and whiteness to that. And now it's trying to develop a church that says, it's, that fulfills the law for what the law could not do and it, it was weak through the flesh, 
God did by sending his one and only begotten son to make us one. And so we would be the in living. He would be the in living, uh, out living of the in living Christ. That's the gospel. I've been crucified with Christ. Okay. So let's hear from Matt his story of coming to this oneness idea of the church and then trying to live that out in a creative way. Matt, speak to us. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Uh, say blessings and honor on your life and Vera May, we love you and the Perkins family and the foundation. It's an honor to serve with you. And your friendship has not only inspired me, it has transformed me. And thank you for investing into a younger brother like me that's trying to carry out this gospel work here in Atlanta now. Yeah, when we first moved to uh, Mississippi, even before we moved to Mississippi to plant a church that would be for all people, we said, what would be a name of a church that would uh, represent such unity? And so we, we got it out of Ephesians chapter four, where he says one body, one father, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We said, well, let's call it one church. So we can, uh, in the title of the church, the name of the church, we can begin to share uh, what oneness could look like. And Dr. Perkins was there to honor that birth of that new church eight years ago in March. He stood there with me on that stage, uh, giving a blessing over the birth of that church in Jackson. So, so many fond memories. And uh, so in our text today, as we're looking at um, first Peter again, and we're in chapter three, we've been reminded that uh, the previous passage, like Phil taught last week and others recently have taught that Peter, uh, the apostle, the author of this book has been addressing daily and practical living of the faith in specifically how to deal with relationships with people. And so like even specifically, he said, uh, submit to the governing authorities around you. And then he said, you must submit to those that you work with and your relationships at work. And then he said, you must submit uh, to each other in marriage. And so all of that can be summed up in the word submission to submit to God and submit to one another. And so we look at our text today in light of that, Peter continues uh, this, this theme of submission. And we, we're going to look here in verse eight in just a moment, but we're reminded that Jesus prayed for oneness in the high priestly prayer in John 17, where he prayed, Father, make them one until there is complete unity so that the world may know me and may know you. And so I always say oneness creates witness. The stronger our oneness and unity, uh, the, the greater our witness collectively in the world. And so I always am reminded that in a beautiful, diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural church family that we see God birthing all across the nation here, is that oneness doesn't mean sameness. That, that oneness does not mean sameness. Uh, oneness does not, uh, does not mean sameness. It means we don't have to all be assimilating to the exact same thing. And so we look at our passage here today, and I don't know if somebody there has my slides that can share uh, as I'm going through the scripture. I want to start there in, uh, with uh, 1 Peter 3, and let's look at uh, verse 8, just that first part of it. And he says here in 1 Peter 3, 8, in that first part, he said, finally, and so when Peter's writing finally, he's like, okay, I'm wrapping it up, but I got a couple more last thoughts. And so he says, finally, this is like the preacher after he already preached a sermon, he's got one more thing to say. <laughs> so he's like, finally, all of you be like-minded, be like-minded. And so a lot of us, we'll stop right there for a moment, because when you hear the words, be like-minded church, that we need a church that's like-minded, uh, that a lot of times we think that that means we all got to agree on everything. And that's not what Peter is referring to. 
It doesn't mean that you and I have to agree on everything socially, politically, uh, how we spend our money, how we how we manage our life. That's it. Uh, even our cultural preferences. That's not what Peter is referring to. He's saying you got to be like minded, being kingdom minded, kingdom minded. You know, I heard someone years ago, and I think this came from one of the early church fathers, say in essentials, unity in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love. And that's family. That's where, you know, we don't all have to look the same, think the same, or vote the same, but we are called to be like-minded, meaning kingdom-minded. And so I think that's the key here that he's trying to get to. Now, there is, by the way, a, uh, a practical expression of this, because the Gospel Coalition is a, a national coalition pr promoting the gospel. Um, they have offerings all the time on their website, and they have seminars and online podcasts, stuff like that. I'm going to drop in the chats something that they are presenting to the, to the church, the body of Christ, and it's called Good Faith Debates, <laughs> meaning that even Christians might debate one another and so they're creating good faith debates. One of the topics, I think it's five different topics they're going to be debating. They're trying to model how to debate one another in our faith without hurting each other, without being harmful, or, or uh, we, can be, we can disagree without being disagreeable. We can still love one another, even though we don't agree on everything. Now, some of you know, um, I've been married to my beautiful wife. Uh, for 36 years now, and we are like-minded, but we do not agree on everything. <laughs> there are so many things we don't agree on, but we do agree on the main things. We are like-minded in our faith. We're like-minded in our love for God and our love for one another, and so we are majoring on the majors, and we try to minor on the minors, <laughs> and that, that keeps our marriage in oneness where the two become one flesh, right? And so that's the that's the goal of the church. So that's the like-minded piece. Now, Peter doesn't stop there. He, he's got a list of five things. This is the first one. Finally, all of you be like-minded. Now look at the next part of the sentence. He says, be sympathetic. Finally, all of you be sympathetic. So in the first part of that verse we just read, he said, be like-minded. That means think alike. Now here he's saying, feel alike. Sympathy comes from the Greek word. Part of that word is pathos, which uh, means to feel deeply, to feel. So he's saying, y'all got to feel together. You got to feel like you feel. Share the feelings with, again, that God's given us. One pastor said, you're hurt in my heart. I want to feel your hurt in my heart. I, I, Dr. Perkins taught me early on when he first started mentoring me. He said, Matt, you've got to learn to enter into the pain of your brother and your sister. That, that was a, a turning point for me when it came to creating beautiful, diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural multilingual churches, people, a church that looks more like heaven and actually tries to act more like heaven. And so not just bringing diversity to the room, but justice to the world. And so we're seeing God do that, but it's partly because I learned, leaned into being sympathetic. So one way that I've learned to do this is to listen more deeply to my brothers and sisters of color and the pain of their story and that listening allows me to feel what they're feeling, to enter into the pain of my brother and my sister. Let's keep going. Peter doesn't stop there. So he says, finally, all of you be sympathetic, but look at the next uh, part of the sentence. He says, love one another. Well, that sounds real simple. Cause I mean, that's the, that's the crux of the gospel right there. That's that, that transcends all the other things that Peter's talking about, you know, L love, the, the gospel love. And uh, Pastor Albert Tate was on here just a few weeks ago teaching, 
and did a phenomenal job. And so uh, I pre-ordered his book that I put a picture up there on the screen for you, Love, How We Love Matters. And I think a lot of his writing is in, in, in my theology is inspired by Dr. Perkins that always reminds us love is the final fight, that Peter knew that. And Peter presented that as part of the five pieces of how to really build healthy Christian faith-based relationships. And of course, he could not exclude love. Love is the key to this whole thing, right? And so, uh, what, oh, oh, an early church father, by the way, uh, Tertullian of Carthage, um, maybe you've heard of him. He was actually African. He was a brother of color and, uh, and, and a church historian and theologian. He wrote some amazing early church theology that we still apply to today. Now, it's uh, unfortunate that his ethnicity was minimized through history of the church, but here we are later, all these years later, we're trying to honor uh, the ethnicity and, um, and heritage of the Christian faith by brothers like Tertullian of Carthage. And he writes at one point about the, um, the Roman Empire that didn't understand this Christian movement it, to the point that they actually hired spies, the Roman Empire, to go into churches the early church, secretly kind of infiltrate them and write a report and report back to the Central Intelligence Agency of the Roman Empire, so to speak. And so Tertullian writes about these spies and their reports. And I want you to listen to one report from one of the spies that, that had been infiltrating a church. Listen to what it said. These Christians are very strange people. They, they meet in an empty room to worship. They have no image to worship. They speak of one by the name of Jesus, who is absent, but whom they seem to be expecting at any moment. And my, how they love him and how they love one another. I just kind of wonder, people, if our government would send spies into our local churches, the body of Christ here in America, to write a report and send it back to the authorities, I wonder what they would write today. And to me, um, I'm afraid to know <laughs> what they might, oh my, how they argue with one another. Oh my, how they fuss and fight and judge one another. Oh my, I mean, I wonder, I wonder what, what would be written of our churches today if spies were to come in in secret. And, and, you know, I think this is what Peter's getting to here. You know, he's getting to the core of the gospel, which is love one another as we love God. That's beautiful reconciliation when we love one another. He doesn't stop there. Let's keep moving. He goes on and he says, finally, all of you be compassionate, be compassionate. Now, I, I took a, a, a put up a picture there on this slide of, of someone creating a heart with their hands, but intentionally over their stomach area, their gut. The reason is the Greek word for compassion or being compassionate means to feel it in your gut you know, intestinal fortitude. It really literally means your intestines, your guts. And so a lot of times, like one version even says, instead of compassion, it says be tender hearted, but it's kind of like be tender gutted. And I don't know about you, but when I hear of crisis or tragedy or catastrophe of any of my family and friends, my gut hurts. Have you ever had that where You've heard, uh, like, like when I heard just a few weeks ago that we lost our beloved brother, Big John, and that, you know, being such a young man and, and passing so suddenly, when I heard that news, I got sick to my stomach. My gut hurt. And, uh, of course, my compassion for his wife, Patrice, and the three kids and the rest of the family, 
and, and that we who loved Big John and man, he became one of my first friends in Jackson when I relocated there to plant the church. In fact, he and I kind of planted uh, beautiful, diverse churches, multi-ethnic churches simultaneously. We gave birth to our two churches almost uh, at the same time. And so my friendship went deep with him. And so when I heard of that, my gut hurt for a long time. I, th I think that's the testimony here of Peter. When you build relationship and love for one another, and you hear of one of your friends or family members hurting, you'll feel it deep in your gut. That's, that's when you know your compassion is legitimate, when you feel it deeply with each other. This past uh, Sunday, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, I had the beautiful privilege uh, to baptize my mother. I don't know too many sons that have the honor to baptize their mom, but I did. And I tell you, it was glorious. It was amazing. I flew up to Ohio to be with her. She asked if I'd come up to baptize her. And I tell you, um, it, it was a beautiful experience, uh, emotional and spiritual. It was amazing. And here's why, because my mom, this is my birth mom I'm referring to. She was 17 years old when she had me out of wedlock and was forced by her family to give me up to adoption. So she held me for three days before they pulled, her, pulled me from her arms and put me into a foster family for a while until I was adopted as a child. Mm. And I did not know my birth mom for 54 years. And we didn't know each other. We didn't know where we were or how we, what was going on in our lives. And, and then just four years ago, we got reconnected and, uh, and our love's begun to grow. And the reason I bring this up on this point is because when she told me that she was forced to give me away and the circumstances around that and the pain, the deep pain around my mom being forced to give me up, my compassion, my gut hurt when I heard that story of my birth and the pain that she went through as a teenage single mom being forced to give up her child and that she actually rejected God because of this for years. And now here we are full circle all these years later, and she's given her life to Christ and was just baptized on Easter. That, that that deserves a little amen, hallelujah. It was a beautiful experience. It really was. And my, how they love one another. Here's the last thing after the compassion. He says, and all of you, finally, be humble. Humble is, the, is this final five piece um, that he's sharing here. Be humble. Uh, and... This is very countercultural for Peter to write this during the Roman Empire, during the persecution that these early Christians were going under at that time. Man, um, he said, you got to be humble, even though you're being persecuted. He was really teaching them, love your enemy, it, it, like Jesus taught us. And it's, it's hard for us to re be reminded of this, because even here in America, we have what we call American exceptionalism where we believe that our country is the greatest and we've got the greatest government system, the greatest people, the greatest innovators, the greatest economy, you know, we're the greatest. And so American exceptionalism actually fights against this beautiful spirit, Christ-like spirit of humility. And we who love Jesus have to be reminded of this to fight against pride, which is an enemy to love. And, and so this, this is a beautiful reminder that we've got to practically be teachable for our entire lifetime. I mean, I know brothers like Dr. Gary Vander Ark and Dr. Perkins and, and uh, some Bob Goff and so many others of you that are a little my senior, you guys have so much more knowledge than I do. You have so much um, information about the gospel and the word of God. You're studied, you're theologians. Oh my gosh, Nettie Winters and all of you, I have such respect for Phil Reed and all of you that have um, paved the way for guys like me. But I, this reminds me that no matter what age we're at, we got to stay teachable. We got to stay humble 
so that we're, our pride doesn't get in the way so we can still learn something new that God wants to teach us. And here's the practical piece is that finding ways to listen and learn, lament and repent. To listen, to learn, lament and repent. And so, man, I've, I've got a lot to learn as a pastor of a multi-ethnic, beautifully diverse church. Churches that are trying to look more like heaven and act more like heaven. I, I'm constantly saying, God, teach me. God, help me. One way I do that that's a practical way maybe for you is to do audio books. And I intentionally listen to brothers and sisters of color so that I can remain teachable in the culture I come from, my heritage is not the same as others that are in my church. So a way I can stay humble is to be teachable and to constantly lean in and listen. Listen to Jamar Tisby's podcast that he puts out all the time. That Those are ways for me to lean in and listen and stay humble and teachable. I think that's a practical thing. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up because of our time with uh, just verse 9 next and we'll be done. So look at, look at verse 9 with me. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but rather on the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Wow. That's powerful. That's so powerful. We're, we're going to stop with this verse because I want to remind you here. It's obvious, right? That, that we, and Peter being the one to write this, he, he's the one that picked up the sword in the garden and, uh, and hacked off the ear of the high priest servant, you know, and here, and I say that to remind us that look at God transforming the life of Peter, that here he is years later, learning from his previous mistakes and impulses to repay evil for evil. And here he's teaching us, oh, don't do that. Don't do what I did. Don't, uh, don't. No, if we're following Jesus, then we've got to love our enemies where we're, we can't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Here, here's the thing is that actually the, the Jewish law allowed you, gave you permission to repay evil with evil. Did you know that in the Old Testament? That law was a justice law. It was called lex talionis. Lex talionis. Lex talionis, it means you can repay evil for evil. You remember the saying Jesus said, you've heard it taught. If uh, to repay uh, an eye for an eye, a limb for a limb, right? That was the law of the Jews called lex talionis. It was a justice law. It said, if someone did that to you, you have the right within your right to repay that evil that they did to you equally. Now, what's funny about this law, <laughs> what's crazy about this law, it, it was actually created to limit vengeance and over retaliation. Because I don't know about you, but if somebody came up to my child and knocked their eye out, me as a father, what am I going to do to retaliate? I'm going to not just take one eye. I'm going to take both eyes, <laughs> right? And, and, and so th this law, it sounds like, oh, well, that's justice. That's fair. Lex talionis, an eye for an eye, an ear for an ear, and I, you know, a limb for a limb. But a limb Jesus, limb. Jesus said, <laughs> no, no, we, we live above this law. Peter writes, no, on the contrary, repay evil with a blessing. So you don't strike back, you bless back. Listen, this principle practically, and I'll finish here, needs to apply on social media. <laughs> you don't strike back, you bless back. Oh man, I have had to learn such restraint on Facebook and social media when, when I post something and someone, even my brothers and sisters in Christ may come back and try to create controversy on my post or, I mean, try to say something political where I had nothing to say political. I was talking about the kingdom, the gospel, and all of a sudden they turn on it and I, they're, oh, y'all just don't know. There are times that we who love Jesus have to have such great restraint where we say, I will not strike back, I will bless back. And so, oh man, what, 
what great reminders today. And we, we learned that even from, you know, the beautiful testimony of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, what, what he reminded us of nonviolent direct action, you know, and even 59 years ago this week during Holy Week and following Easter uh, in 1963, he wrote an epistle to the church um, called Letters to the, from the Birmingham Jail. And what a great reminder that it would have been in Dr. King's um, authority to strike back with the words that were written to him by the white brothers and sisters of Birmingham that were trying to uh, be, create controversy, but instead he wrote with authority, but he blessed them back by his words, letter from a Birmingham jail. What a great reminder that we are people of love, uh, people of restraint, people of humility, uh, people of compassion, people of sympathy, and Thank God Peter has directed us that way today. So I'll finish with that. Thank you all for having me here to uh, share some of the word of God with you today. It spoke to my life. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Matt, can you, I remember one thing that, that you shared when Pastor Tate spoke was on, I think you called it a two mile Christian and the idea of taking that the extra mile and I remember that that resonated with you and I think it seems to fit with the this uh bless back reminder so um I know that you probably don't have that in your notes this morning but uh can you comment on what I think what you referred to as the two mile Christian yeah you know the the law the Roman law was that if a Roman soldier came up to anyone in the Roman empire and said carry my backpack or carry my weapon or carry whatever, uh, you were instructed by law to carry it for a mile. And most people had to, there was no option, it was law. And so that was the requirement. But what, what the word of God was reminded us of is go the extra mile. You know, don't go with the minimum requirement. Show them, even your enemy, that you're gonna bless them even more by carrying that Roman backpack the second mile. Mm. And so, yeah, it's going above and beyond. It's, it's really being what the word of God reminds us to be a peculiar person, mm -hmm. to be so loving and Christ-like that it shocks the world. Isn't that part of Peter's message, right? We are a peculiar people and we don't just simply meet the minimum bare requirements. We go, uh, Matt, Matt, your first book will be called Beyond the Requirement. That'll be your, uh, I'm, I'm naming your first book. Um, I'm thinking, you know, one of the things that is so important for us, and it's good to see Lonnie on the call. It's, we have a lot of our family on the call today. It's really like a homecoming to see uh, uh, Deneen and Sherry and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of our friends here. Uh, I'm thinking about how we've heard a message from Dr. Perkins, from Ron Spann, from Albert Tate, and now Matt. Uh, when I'm listening for the Holy Spirit to speak something to, is a thread, this reminder that Ron, Ron Spann talked about of the, the, that there's a different, there's a higher way to love. There's a, a more powerful love that exceeds the minimum requirement. And this, you know, nonviolent protest, nonviolent resistance would cause people to say, as you said earlier, Matt, when you talked about the investigation, this is a peculiar people. They worship a God they can't see. They don't respond. They don't retaliate. They don't strike. They don't take advantage of their rights. But we respond to persecution with blessing. We pray for our, our enemies. We love those who don't love us. And, and it's, it's coming back to love is the final fight, isn't it? Amen. Other thoughts from uh, regarding this, this great message and this great thank you, Matt, for this provocative study that gets us to think deeply about our own lives. Yeah, I think that's the point. Um, I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to pray. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And I want us all to pray because sometimes we can hear teaching and we take it as teaching and not the invitation from the Lord mm. to do what our brother said. He said, repent, 
change the way we think. That was the forerunner message of John the Baptist ushering in Christ. And I think it's befitting as we celebrate this Holy Week that the Lord would give us this invitation to repent, mm -hmm. to be like him. So Lord, I just ask you in this moment as we pause, would you put the spotlight of your Holy Spirit on our hearts? Yes. Whatever the areas are, Lord, that we need to submit to you, give us the grace, boldness, mm -hmm. courage, and humility to agree with what you say. Mm -hmm. I confess even now, Lord, of my own shortcoming of striking back when I should be blessing back. Mm -hmm. Lord, I, I, I repent of pride, of not being teachable, mm -hmm. not being quick to listen. And I ask you for your grace. Lord, I ask you to, even now, illumine to our minds the areas that we still hold on to our own opinions mm. and do not have the like-mindedness of Christ. We ask for a kingdom invasion. Mm. Would you offend lies with your truth lodged yes. in our minds? Would you break and destroy strongholds of the mind? And would you give us the freedom and liberty to accept your invitation to be like you, to be servants. Lord, give us that compassion that Matt spoke of, Lord, that gut compassion, mm. pass the head to the heart, Lord, do something that only you can do. And ask, Lord, that you would continue to be in our conversations. Let us ask the questions and make the statements that bring clarity to hearts edification to each other and ultimately honor to your name yes in jesus name i pray mm. amen amen, amen. Mm. thanks curtis this brings up a lot of uh i'm sure thinking about how we all respond to whether it's the the offense of something that was a text message or social media or uh, any number of things, how we respond and how we respond as Christians, not just as human beings or um, how we respond based on our, the nation that we live in. But uh, let's, uh, let's respond to this. What's, um, what's the Lord stirring up in you? What are, what are your thoughts and uh, maybe questions? I'd like to quickly jump in, uh, Chris. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to to brother to Pastor Matt. And it's you know it, it's it's a morning of humility. It just feels like as as um, Pastor Chris, you know, just this place where God is saying there's a Khalil, there's a response here. Is again, as Curtis says, it's not just a teaching. And it just reminded me of that the passage, Lord, make us one. That the make mm -hmm. means that we don't naturally become one that there's a forging, there's a place where we have to die to ourselves and that mm -hmm. humility and that mm -hmm. the, re the reality of becoming one is that we allow ourselves to walk in humility with those to suffer with, to have compassion with, and that we never position ourselves above another person or another culture. Amen. You know, think about, the, think about when the Lord shows his glory to Moses. Remember when, you know, when, when Moses says, show me your glory, I can't do this without you. And God, God says, I'll, I'll, I'll pass by and show you my glory. And he says, the Lord, the Lord. And then let's pretend that you don't know how the rest of the verse goes, right? And in, in the, in, in the principle of first mentions, the Lord describes himself in a way that is powerful. He could have said, I am the holy God. I'm the perfect God. I'm I'm the just God, but what does he say? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, right? To, to Matt's point, to the, the God who hurts with his creation, right? I am the compassionate and gracious God. I'm leading with you, Moses. I understand. I hurt too. And then when Jesus describes himself, the only place, right? And he, and he says, come to me, all you who are weary, because I am what, it, to, to, to Melinda's point, gentle and humble. Oh, how we would be compassionate, gentle, and humble as, as a people. 
And the beautiful reminder is from Peter is he's writing to the church, the body of Christ, the brothers and sisters, you know, so just a reminder, he's not, he's not, he's not writing to people outside the church. He's writing to people inside the church and keep in mind too, that almost every church that was established and, and planted and, and begun in the early church were all beautifully diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural, mm-hmm. Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, barbarians, Scythians, free, slave, <laughs> women, men, you know. So it was a um there was a holy tension in every new body of Christ that was unlike the Jewish synagogue that most of them came from, where there was a homogeneous experience. Now they were forced into a multicultural, even multi-faith, mm. a multilingual body of Christ, a new thing that God was doing to bring all people together. That's where that oneness, I, I love what uh, Dr. Mingo said, it, 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 there is a tension. And I love what she said. She used the word <coughs> forge, that God is working <coughs> on us and forging us, which if you're forging metal, it's going to take some fire. It's going to, it's going to have uh, some heat. And you and you're going to feel that in a uh, in an intentional biblical multi ethnic church, you know mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And this new way of living even impacts marriage, isn't that what Phil and Marcia were talking about? How how wives and husbands treat each other is so peculiar, right, and unusual. This this love, this way that we do things. Other comments, questions, thoughts? How does this speak to you? Um, I was Doug, I was just going to um, you know, kind of summarize, you know, how it um how it impacts me, you know, a lesson a lessons on love and humility, which which I don't always have. But you know, when we're constantly asking the Holy Spirit to give us that agape love, mm. you know, and and that but humility that will lead to reconciliation and it will lead to a unified church and that unified church is the answer you know to you know just showing uh, the secular culture a better way or what the truth is you know that that is i mean that's the key and you know i pray for myself and i pray for others that others get this powerful message that pastor matt just shared with us amen thank you doug Mm -hmm. Yeah, divided world needs a united church mm. as a as a testimony and witness, mm. and so um, such a divided, beautifully multi ethnic nation, but divided, and they need to see the witness of the gospel through a united multi ethnic church. Mm. Jody, you've got a question or comment. Um, I, excuse me, um, Pastor Matt, I wanted to thank you. Um, this was really breathtaking. Greetings from your brothers and sisters in Rwanda in the Great Lakes region. <clears throat> On Sunday, I had the great joy of being in a church service that was made up of Rwandans, Ugandans, Burundians, Congolese, South Sudanese, and Sudanese. And I don't know how much you know about this part of the world, so much evil and horror has taken place um, for all sorts of conflict. But to see your brothers and sisters in Christ and my brothers and sisters in Christ, testimony after testimony, talking about this passage in Peter and talking about the ability to be reconciled and the ability of the resurrection to bring life to us. And it was absolutely, I wish I could have brought all of you with me because it was Mm -hmm. just an incredible, spoke powerfully, I think, to the churches here, uh, certainly in the region. And I know that there have been times where black and white churches and other churches of color have been together. And those of us that are not of color have had opportunities to ask for forgiveness. Mm. So to see Rwandans asking for forgiveness of the Congolese Mm. and Hutu and Tutsi asking forgiveness for each other. And it was just, it was a Mm. six hour service and it could have gone for 24. It was one of the most powerful things. So wow. uh, you're talking about your birth mom, Pastor Matt, kind of brought that back. Uh, just a really, really breathtaking um, 
memory, recent memory. So I wanted to say thank you and let you know that those kinds of things are happening in this part of the world. And I'm really grateful for the example of the Perkins family and so many others that, in Jackson that have mentored that for people around the world. So mm. thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jody. That's powerful. Yeah, I've been to Kenya where there are 43 tribes in represented in Kenya. And our ministry over there is actually creating multi-tribal churches where the, the, the tribal barriers are breaking down because of the gospel, like you're describing. That's just the, you know, being a peacemaker between tribes. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. That's powerful. Hmm. Others? I was thinking, Matt, I, I don't know if we have time for all this because we're too busy just deciding about vaccinations and masks. I don't know if we have time for this conversation about love. <laughs> right. Oh. Hey, Joanne. Hi, hey, good then, morning. Hey, then, Ryan. Hi, hi, Pastor Matt. It was a uh, great words there. I have a question for you. Um, I'm an admin to a pastor who, um, who has a group called Together. Together We Pray. They just shortened it together. Um, um, where they're trying to get, you know, unity between all the churches in Rhode Island. And he's uh, started to branch out to Spanish and, and, and Black leaders, which is great. And, mm -hmm. and it's starting to happen. Um, and I, uh, in turn, have started this little ministry where I go around and um, on uh, like on this, what I'm trying to do. I've done it in my home and invited all these pastors to come that I knew um, to uh, through hospitality, bring churches together like on a Sunday afternoon, one sir, one mm -hmm. church serve the other church a lunch mm -hmm. and it would be a different uh, culture church. And I would bring a program of like fun games, seriousness, and and um, some concepts from the gospel, and it just seems like around here the pastors like the idea of it, but they seem to feel like the key is getting um, their church like to godliness. Mm. But it's almost like if they just crashed into if they if they this is an issue that the Lord is speaking to the church about. Pay attention. Can't you see it's all around you? It's on fire. It's all around. Mm -hmm. But they're not paying attention. This, they're still teaching. Let's be good Christians. And how did you break through that barrier? And are you, uh, do you, you obviously travel? Um, I'm thinking of maybe um, approaching the leader and seeing if you could come to talk to these pastors. But how did you break through that? Yeah, I'd be honored to at some point. Um, but, uh, you know, great question, Joanne. I, I think the what your pastor and other pastors seem to be doing is the right pathway by saying, first, befriending the other pastors, making personal contact with them, um, and inviting them to pray together. Uh, I've seen cities transformed because pastors started praying together. And so when, to me, that's the key even when we relocated to Jackson to launch the church there, that was, I think, one of my first assignments from the Lord was to find the spiritual fathers and mothers of the city to begin praying together for unity of the body of Christ. So I think that pr those prayer moments lead to love and reconciliation. Um, and so, and breaking down denominational barriers and ethnic barriers and church tradition barriers. And so, uh, yeah. And then, because we all, we really do have more in common than we don't. And especially the gospel unites us. That's, that's the beauty where he says, be like-minded. And all of those churches that love the Lord, they have that one kingdom mind that they can recognize, even though they might take communion differently, or they might express worship differently, or those all, all those little, I call them pre church preferences and if we could just begin to uh, diminish our church personal preferences and crucify them so that we can think more highly of those other people's preferences and elevate them, a lot of unity can happen. And I've seen it in every city I've been to. And, but yeah, the prayer is the key. That's the, that sounds like exciting work that they're already beginning. And, and by the way, it takes time. It's not... Mm -hmm. 
you can't microwave it. It's um, it, it may take a year or two or three, but that's a beautiful thing that your pastors are doing in your city. Amen. Brian. Yeah, I think that for me, um, what I've been learning by just being a part of the Bible studies is that it's really important to listen. And I really appreciate, uh, Pastor Matt, what you had to share today. Um, I don't like to listen. Um, I like to talk and hear myself talk. And so a part of, I like to be right. And, and this has really been helpful to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. So I just want to appreciate, you know, say I appreciate what you had to say today. This, this passage is so powerful and it could probably be 20 sermons or more. Um, and I need them all. I would need every one. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, thank God Ryan. for the conviction of the Holy spirit on all of us when we open the word of God and you know that thank God that it's not just all conviction, but there's compassion from the Lord too, that, you know, gives us grace. That's beautiful. Curtis, do you want to handle this uh, prayer request? Yeah, we just had a um, message that actually, um, um, Philip Perkins and Alice, they, were, they just had a fire at their home and it's still going on. And so we're going to just stop and, and pray right now. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Actually, Sister Melinda, Pastor Melinda, go ahead and pray for them around this situation. Yeah. So, Father, we're just praying right now your immediate assistance and help mm. whatever is needed in this situation and again we just heard father the teaching about coming alongside and suffering with and so father we just pray especially lord jesus that what the enemy has meant for evil that in the midst of this here that you have a strange way of turning around for good mm. father your comfort your your assistance your protection god in the midst of all of this here mm -hmm. and god the immediate testimony and assistance of you the holy spirit which you would bring in this here we pray yes. that god and we pray it in jesus name and jesus. lord we also declare this morning too that as we pray for this family and what's going on right now mm -hmm. that father that we will see that we are not people who just pray words to pray we will see and hear how you have come alongside and been the paraclete mm -hmm. in this situation. Mm -hmm. And we right. pray that in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. We'll keep you updated too uh, throughout and also how we can just come alongside and support them as well. Thank you all. Yeah. Philip, he just, you know, lost his son, you know, um, and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. from the photos, it's a it's a complete total loss of everything. Oh. Man. So, mm. yeah. Who is that? Philip and Alice. Mm. 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 JP, you didn't know, but you, we heard the sirens going uh, when Bible study first started. That was them going over there. Oh, man. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. We lost our niece this past week, too. He what? We lost our niece this past week, my brother's daughter. Yes, I heard about that. We're so sorry. We're mm. so sorry. Uh, she was missing for a while. I saw the report, the news report on that. Yeah, Sunday to Thursday. They finally found her on Thursday, but I think she died on, on uh, Sunday. On Carol, though. Mm. Wow. We should pray for the global. We don't know the cause of the death or anything yet, but we'll be coming there for the funeral. The funeral's going to be there in, in uh, Jackson this coming Sunday at two o'clock. In Jackson, Mississippi. It's going to be in I think Edwards, Mississippi. Edwards, Edwards. That's a little town about ten miles outside of Jackson. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's where their family was, most of their family's from, I think. Uh, my brother's wife's family. Mm -hmm. um, Curtis, can we, pray for, can we pray yeah. for the Govan family? That's a, yeah. um, a, a absolute loss. She was 20 years old, mm. young girl, um, mm. went missing, and um, they, they ended up finding her body, and um, and she was she was gone. Mm. So mm. Mm. Uh, a shy young she, girl. Uh, yeah, they think she committed suicide. Mm. Really. Let's do this. There's there's a lot of needs that are here, uh, even on the call. There are folks who have mentioned spouses that have, you know, um, had some sickness. There are um, folks who have lost young ones. You know, my wife and I just came back from Nebraska. Um, her cousin lost his nine-year-old to cancer. And so there's just a ton of things that people are going through. I'm going to ask Pastor Matt if you can pray for um, the, the, the need that was just mentioned with the Govans, with yeah. that family that is bereaved. Um, Ron Spann, I'm going to ask you to follow up and pray for marriages on this line. And then um, Dr. Van Dark, you can just end with our closing prayer and benediction and we will connect on next Tuesday. Love you all, and I uh, look forward to us connecting, and we'll continue to keep each other in prayer throughout the week. Mm -hmm. As the Lord flashes people's names and minds, let's be sensitive and just cover mm -hmm. each other in that place of prayer. Uh, it's the greatest way that we can actually extend his love is to talk to him about each other. Amen. Amen. So, Father God, we just uh, begin this moment of prayer and say thank you for life. It is a gift from you, from heaven. And Lord, you gave that gift of life to this, your beautiful daughter, just 20 years old. And uh, 20 years ago, she she was given this life, Lord. And so we pray that as her life has been taken from this side of heaven, that you would help the family uh, grieve well during this season, especially. Um, Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit is a comforter um, amidst our grief and our hurt and heartache. And Father, um, this family's, uh, they, they're, they're feeling it deeply in their gut. Their guts hurt right now, God. It is painful. And so, Father, we're asking for some spiritual relief of their pain and that, God, they would sense the power of your presence, your loving arms wrapping around them as they prepare for a home going. And just pray, Father, that you just bless them. Let, let what has come of this turn, turn it around, Lord, and use it for good. Let it be a testimony to those of us on this side of heaven that still have life and breath. That God, it would uh, challenge us, convict us, and change us to be more like you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we still resonate with our brother Phil's celebration of the friendship of marriage, of that partnership, and that shared vocation, and that call to unity that you give to the partners of marriage. Lord, we have some hurting relationships, some hurting marriages uh, before us now. Uh, where there is injury, we know, Lord, that you can make readily a, a wealth of pardon, of forgiveness. And, Lord, the love that covers a multitude of sins. Lord, uh, a generosity, love that cancels all debts. Lord, you know how much our flesh craves to collect all the back rent that we think we are owed in our relationships. Help us to forgive that debt. Help us to forgive one another's debts to each other and live out of the abundance of the grace that subsidizes that is the inexhaustible budget of our life together. Lord, we pray for those who grieve loss, uh, 
partners and friends who now have been taken away and are bereft, console them. Blessed are those who mourn, bring them strength and comfort. Uh, but thank you for the peace uh, that you call us to pursue, uh, that you know our desire to live long days. And we want long marriages and fruitful marriages. So bring mercy and love. you may be glorified of the healing and the hope that it's restored. Hola, hemos estado tratando de comunicarnos con usted en relación con el contrato de servicio de su vehículo. I'm sorry. Did I was praying and I asked you who I heard I did not know I was praying with my friend who was living in my thing muted all that time. But uh, we do lift up the marriages in our midst that are hurting the Lord for your healing. I need to be and as you. Ask your mercy, Lord, um, on those who need it this day, um, that they, what was meant for harm can be changed to good. In Jesus' name we pray. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. 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 We we're gonna rush to. I'm gonna rush to see what happened to Philip. Yes. Yeah. We'll end here, so, JP. Yes. And the, so you guys also, if you look in the chat, there's a link to help the Govan family funeral for GoFundMe. If you feel so moved and want to actually contribute to that, then it's right there. We'll leave the room open a little bit for you to click on that. Otherwise. We love you all deeply and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you all. Have a good day. Thanks for the prayers. Keep us in your prayers. We will, we will, my brother. <laughs>